I had to run here quickly and drop this content regarding all these massive changes that are happening with the immigration, specifically looking at the international students and the skilled migrant visa, which is where a lot of you are concerned and that's probably why you're here. If you want to understand a little bit more about what's happening, this video is for you. I'm going to break down the key points and some of the things that might concern you. Stay tuned. You're probably going to have questions, so subscribe. I'll be in the comments section replying as much as possible and posting videos on updates as they appear. Hi everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I know it's been a while, your girl hasn't been feeling well and I'm just giving a shout out to all the new subscribers because we've had quite a few join in. Thank you for joining the family and yes, we're still going to have the giveaway as promised. Nothing is going to change in that regard. It's going to be a Christmas slash New Year giveaway and I'm going to be collaborating as well. So just stay tuned to the channel. That's definitely coming up. If you're here to understand this complicated document, hopefully I break the barrier or the confusion that is what is happening right now. OK, so the researcher in me <laughs> has gone ahead to break it down into understandable steps, if that makes sense. If you see me looking down at my screen, it's because I've taken notes because I had to make sure that everything I'm giving you guys is accurate the first thing i'm going to be talking about is the category so i've broken them down into three distinct categories but interrelated the key changes for international students and skilled migrants outlined in the strategy right in that migrant strategy document so the first thing is um, strengthening the integrity and quality of international education the second thing is restricting onshore visa hopping the third thing is supporting international students and graduates to realize their full potential. They have introduced measures to improve the quality of education and to ensure that the entrants are genuine. What that means is that you can no longer come on a student visa with the hopes of hopping onto another visa or study courses that are not relevant just to stay and work. So your courses have to be significant and something that is needed by the Australian government or the Australian, uh, by Australia in general, um, for you to then transform or progress to permanent residency. Disclaimer, I'm not an agent. I'm just someone that knows how to understand documents, if that makes sense. Okay, first thing they're doing is increasing the English language requirements. And I know this is like something that a lot of people have panicked about because already IELTS or TOEFL, whatever it is, you do, a PTE, is already kind of tough for some people to get just the band that they require. And now it's gone up, but there's some consolation here. The consolation is that it's only gone up by 0 0.5. Okay. It's not a massive increase, but it's gone up by 0 0.5. So I'm going to read out the increase here for you so that you understand. Okay. So the test score required for temporary graduate visa will increase from an international language testing system, English IELTS, basically from six to 6.5. Like I said, a 0.5 increase. Then the test score required for a student visa, so coming in on a student visa for IELTS will increase from 5.5 to 6. And then the test score required for students undertaking, you know, there's something called ELICOS. It's the English language intensive course for overseas students. And this usually happens before the students start their main course. And that's going to increase from 4.5 to 5. And they've said this just ensures that. They have higher quality students that understand English because your ability to understand English is symbolic or is indicative of your performance in the education sector overall. OK, that's what they're saying now under the same topic one. Remember, we've broken it down into three under the same topic one, which is strengthening the integrity and quality of international education. We have applying greater scrutiny to student visa applications from high risk providers. Before we get there, there's another thing that I think is key to highlight on the on the, this topic is that they've now introduced something called a genuine student test to all international students. So this is like probably going to be a test that you sit when you're applying to come in on an international student visa, which wasn't there before. They haven't specified what the test will entail. So it's probably no longer going to be just a document or, or, or a statement that you write to demonstrate the fact that you're genuine, but this is going to be a test that you write. They haven't said if it's going to be an intellectual test or it's going to be a character test. It's all still kind of like in the developing phases. So that's going to be introduced. Another thing is applying greater scrutiny to the student visa applications from high risk providers. Now, this is 
their commitment to increase oversight and control to ensure that the integrity and quality of international education sector. So apparently they're dodgy students, <laughs> dodgy student visa applications, they're dodgy providers. So what they're going to be doing is they've set up a body and they're going to be boosting the capacity of the Australian Skills Quality Authority, ASCA, to put an end to unlawful behavior. So exploiting students through the visa application process, um, to make sure that the providers are actually genuine. Basically, the question is, how do providers even exploit students to start with? And actually, what they're saying is that they offer substandard courses. Sometimes they're not very mindful of uh, like attendance and things like that. And then they provide false or misleading information. They fail to deliver the services that they promise. And this can lead to students not receiving the quality of education that they're paid for. So it sounds like they're, it's in the best interest of us. But I guess the question is, um, who's complaining? Anyways, let me, like I said, this is not a video of my opinion. So another thing the government has said is that they're going to be like, you know, cancelling or putting an end to these providers that are dodgy, but at the same time, they're strengthening the requirements for education providers. So the agents are gonna be scrutinized, the providers are gonna be scrutinized, there's gonna be increased accountability by the agents, and they're gonna develop new risk indicators to identify and address potential exploitation. Apparently there's a lot of exploitation going on, so which is why you should definitely stay tuned to see when I talk about the review, because usually if you're gonna review research or evidence or current migration laws you're going to not just be looking at the laws and the people up there you're going to be actually talking to the migrants as well to see their opinion and see their experiences which is then when you can make a conclusion about exploitation and things like that and i'm sure it's happening so this is a significant document as to how to take care of it so the providers will have to provide more detailed reports about the activities of their agent there's some agents that actively recruit students from one university to another university onshore and they're saying that is going to end they're going to have an authority that's going to make sure that those agents will not be paid commissions when they're transferring students between different education providers within australia okay so agents are probably going to be really frustrated or out of business i don't know how this is going to work and then the second category we've talked about ielts we've talked about the need for now interviews the need for scrutinizing and again let's talk about this because i know firsthand being onshore that a lot of the times sometimes people come in to a reputable university say university of canberra or uts or usage and then because their plan is to transition to another visa or to work or to whatever they're trying to do to get on to permanent residency, the fees are too high. And then they just transfer to uh not dodgy. I can't say they're dodgy providers because they are accredited. Like they are providing education, but a cheaper provider that's maybe not as ranked, as highly ranked. And I guess what they're saying is if you're going to be transferring from a good university to something that is just there, then you don't have the right motives because you want to graduate from the top university to give you a higher chance at getting a good job. And when you get that good job, then you can then promote and help out with the Australian economy. But then, I mean, not everybody can afford Harvard and Oxford. So yeah, I guess. And why are these providers there in the first place if they're not? Incredible. Those are my questions, not my opinion. They're just questions, okay? Now, the second category is restricting onshore visa hopping. It aims to restrict onshore visa hopping, which has contributed to a growing cohort of permanently temporary former international students living in Australia. Uh, the government will apply additional scrutiny to international students applying for another student visa and strengthen and simplify the temporary graduate visas to ensure more graduates are working at their skill level and not becoming permanently temporary. Let me break that down. So what they're saying is you cannot come here and do a course that's not necessarily on the list that they don't need and then decide, I'm just going to hop on to this visa and then just keep working in, say, disability, working in a cafe um, when you've just done IT. You know, you can't keep like jumping into a visa just to stay just to be a permanently temporary, they refer to it as permanently temporary. So you don't have a permanent visa, you have lots of temporary visas and you're just visa hopping. They're saying that's not gonna be allowed. They want people to come in and do a course on the skill and stay in that course. And after you're done with, you know, studying that course, get a job in that field, 
because it's on the skills list, which will then help with the Australian economy. Now, the question, again, not in my opinion, just questions, you know, that we can answer. You can help me answer them in the, dis in the, in the discussion box. My question is, the, the difficulty of most international students is that they've studied, but no one's giving them jobs because everyone wants job experience. Sometimes two years, sometimes one year. The question is, who is going to give them that job that allows them to stay in their skill? It's more like survival of the fittest where they're like, you know what? Let me do what I have to do to pay my bills, which are really high in Australia. Whilst I keep searching for an organization that's going to employ me in my skill with no skill whatsoever. But again, looks like they've thought about it because they're going to be implementing things to help build skills that's transferable to the workplace. So that's, that's, that's a green light. Okay. So I'm trying to tell you guys, I understand the frustration, but it looks like they've considered some of that. And this isn't, it's not a comprehensive document. There are some of the things that are going to roll out next year. So some of you guys are still safe to proceed with whatever visa applications you have. And some of them are already in place. And some of them just need refining a little bit more detail. So my advice is don't panic. I know it sounds crazy, but don't panic there. Just look for what they want and give them what they want. I mean, you can share your experiences down below for us to know your frustration. There are lots of people that say, I'm just graduating. I've done this course. And now they're saying, cause I'm 36. It's really painful. We're going to get to the age thing in a moment. Former students are able to prolong their stay and become even more permanently temporary. This is what's been happening. They're saying by shifting to another student visa while onshore or by shifting back to another student visa from a graduate visa. So you can have a graduate visa and then you're like, oh, I don't still have a pathway to PR. So I'm going to jump back on a student visa. And then from there, jump, just jumping from visa. So they're saying this has to stop whilst you know, the specific details are not provided exactly on how they're going to do this, but definitely it, the document does suggest that the government is looking into measures to address onshore visa hopping, which may include restrictions on transitioning from a graduate visa to a student visa. What they've said there is that there's going to be greater scrutiny applied if you want to go on to another student's visa. So I think because I've heard people saying, oh, once you finish from student visa, you cannot go back again. They've cut everything off. I mean, there's a lot of um, tension in the migrant community, let me just put it like that. And I feel your pain. It's not that they're saying there's greater scrutiny. So you can't go from, let's say engineering to social work. It's not adding up. Do you understand? But for instance, let's say I did public health and I did a general public health masters. And now I want to go back and do a specialization in occupational health and safety. It makes sense to transition. So I think it's just going to be one of those situations where you're going to have to explain your transition, explain your reason for going into a visa. And it has to look genuine back in the day. We never had to do that. It's just another level of a layer of scrutiny. And that's why we have this channel. So people that have been successful to go on another visa, they can come and explain to you what they did because there are people that genuinely want to transfer into a skill that they're interested in. Maybe yes, even from engineering to social work. What if you did engineering and you realize you're not passionate? I did engineering for one semester and I was like, Nope, that's not for me. Story for another day. Um, so what if there are people like that, like what are they supposed to do, especially if they now decide, or, you know, they want to do something on the skilled list. I don't think you can stop them. I just think you're going to be able to have to prove to them that you're genuine. That's it. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the key changes to the 485 graduate visa in Australia, right? We have eligible age restriction, and this is the one that's really getting people, um, panicked. The maximum eligible age for the temporary graduate visa will be reduced from 50 to 35. Ah, that jump is a lot. Oga is a, sorry, sorry. Come back, come back. Okay. So that's a big jump. Um, that's a significant jump from 50 to 35. And I guess in my, my head, my question, not my opinion, just a question is, is 36 a problem? Like 35.5? Like, okay. So anyways, that's, that's besides the information. Um, anyways, so they're changing it from 50 to 35 repositioning the visa as a product for early career professionals not for late career you cannot just you cannot just change your mind halfway and just say ah i want to go and do another course or you're you're on your own it's yeah it's a bit frustrating the african in me comes out sometimes i just don't even i don't know i just I, I, sometimes i think i have control over it i'm very african it's not going anywhere okay come back 
So they're repositioning the visa as a product for early career professionals who can contribute to the Australian economy for a longer period of time. Because if you're 50, you don't have much left time to go. <laughs> it's in the document. I'm so sorry. That is just like, what do you mean for a longer period of time? Oh, I need water. Hold on, hold on. Ah, ah, ah. Ah, okay. Sorry. Sorry, that one took me out. It just it discombobulated my whole thinking. Like... So 50 means you don't have much time to contribute again to the economy. So mm, it is well. Okay. Let's. <laughs> I'm offended on behalf of the 50 year olds. Like legit. Let's keep it rolling, shall we? Also, streaming, renaming and abolishment. They've changed it. So it's no longer temporary graduate visa. It will be renamed to post higher education work or post vocational education work. Okay, mm, to be more descriptive for the relevant applicants. So it's not temporary. They want nothing about temporary because that temporary something has been causing problems and people just want to stay temporary permanently. So they're saying now it's a post higher education work. So it's for higher education work. You get it now? Okay. The replacement stream of the TGV temporary graduate visa and the subclass 476 will be abolished. Sorry, that was grammatic. This new post higher education work visa is going to be faster. Maybe it's going to be like, whew, wacha, like very <laughs> lightning, pam, pam, you got the visa. Maybe that's what they're saying. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Because it has been a source of delay for many graduates, transitions from student to graduate visa. They're making it more f like the, to get the visa faster because the delay is too much for people. I mean, I don't know. This is why I said, I'm not a visa agent. Don't listen to me. Oh. I'm just breaking down English. That's all. And even myself, you see the way my English is jumping. In my experience in the migrant community, amongst our people, people apply for a postgraduate visa. And sometimes it takes up to a year, sometimes six months. I guess that's what they're trying to say. So now it's going to be lightning, watch out, speed, whew, like that. You get your visa. Okay. But I've never heard any, I've never heard anybody complain. Because the counting of the visa only starts when, they, whenever they grant the visa. So if they like, let them take 10 years. When they grant it, your two years starts from then. So in my experience, and I don't know if you're watching from another community, perhaps you're limited. I don't know. Nobody has said, Rosh, oh, give me my temporary graduate visa. They like the delay. Delay is good in this perspective. The question on a lot of people's minds are what are the options for over 35 year olds? And what they've said is that they're going to be introducing new streams of visa because there's, there's, a, there's a bit of an overlay where they want highly skilled applicants, but these might be people that are 35, 36, 37, 38, 40s. Um, where do you draw the line between age and skill? What's more important, the amount in terms of contribution or how long they have to live and work for? Um, this is a, I, yeah, this is a, it's a really dicey one, but I will be giving you updates on the options. I think options for over 35 year olds, visa options, um, after school, but that is definitely there. And they said they'll be releasing more information about more visa streams. Um, definitely talked about, you know, highly skilled visa stream and streamlining the visa process for people that are highly skilled. So it just means that they're just cracking down. You can't come in and just use student visa as a pathway. You have to come in and genuinely study and build up your skills and stand out. Number three, supporting international students and graduates to realize your full potential. Because why? You have to come to Australia and be full. Cannot be half. Okay. The government plans to provide more work integrated learning opportunities. This is where I said light at the end of the tunnel for international students, especially in sectors with strong entry level programs, internships and work experience. The aim is to better prepare students for Australia's skilled workforce and improve their employment outcomes. Remember when I said one of the biggest issues we're having right now is nobody wants to give you a, a job, but the government wants you to work in your skill. And yes, it is true. I know of a PhD student that was working in construction. And what they're saying here is actually the advice I give people. So I have a video coming up where I talk about how to get experience when no one wants to give you experience. And I'm going to talk about that. So this colleague of mine, bless him, very dedicated to his course, which is kind of like what they want, right? Full dedication. That's why they restrict work hours. So we don't just work and work and work and work, right? This guy is very dedicated to his course during his PhD. And he's only doing his PhD, focused on his PhD. And after PhD, happy, goes for graduation, whatnot. 
and guess what nobody wants to hire him why because he was so focused on his during his phd he didn't get any work experience and now he's graduated as a doctor that means he's highly qualified and this is australia where things work it's not like africa where it's who you know if you have a phd you have to be paid over a certain amount there are universities that literally up your pay level once you get a doctorate so no one wants to hire you and pay you more with no experience when they can hire someone with less qualifications and pay them less do you know what i mean so he was working in construction for a long time this is an example of a story of someone that genuinely wants to work in his stream but nobody will hire him so the difference is that while i was doing my phd i was working as a research assistant I would tutor, I will mark, I would do anything. And from there, you kind of get your footing. It's all about getting your footing. And I'll talk about this in the video to come. If you guys want that video on, you know, how to get work experience or how to get your foot into the door in terms of securing an official job in Australia, comment down below and just say, please give us the video on how to secure, you know, an official job in Australia in your field. And, I, and I'll make that video because there are lots of tips that I have that people might not know about. So because I had that experience, when I went out, like it's, I already had a job part-time before my PhD, so they just transferred it to full-time. It was an easy transition. So what the Australian government is saying here is that they're going to be incorporating like skilled work opportunities, like placements, kind of like internships within the degree curriculum so that as, a, as of the time you're graduating, you already technically have work experience. So that means they're gonna be, it's gonna be an interdisciplinary effort. They're gonna be collaborating with lots of organizations and industries to make it happen, which is, you know, promising. Like I said, there is a lot of confusion, but there's no need to panic. This is all developing news. It's all still unfolding and I will give you the updates as they go. Okay. So if you're coming to Australia, this is information you need to know. If you're in Australia and you're frustrated, let me know down below. If you have questions, let me know down below. If there are bits of the document you don't understand, let me know down below. There's a lot to talk about and there's a lot to break down, but just have hope and have faith and everything's going to be okay. So I hope this video was helpful for someone and I try not to make it long, but I mean, I tried, I tried my best. Thank you guys for watching up until this point. I will meet you guys in the comment section and for everyone that's waiting for the giveaway, just get engaged so I can know you so that, you know, I know you and know your story and know a little bit about you and you might be lucky to get the giveaway. Thank you for chilling with Doing Diaspora. We're here to help each other and help each other thrive overseas. And I'll see you guys in my next one. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye bye.